Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. In this week's episode, we're gonna talk about the sales stats for June. They were just released the other day. We're gonna look at where we stand from a sales and inventory perspective, not just compared to last year, but compared to our 10-year average. We're gonna talk about construction costs in Canada. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about what the federal government is doing to help homeowners who might be in tricky situations with their fixed or variable rate mortgages. Real quick, before we get started, if this is your first time to the channel, my name is Hassan. I'm a real estate agent in the Vancouver area, and I make educational real estate content to help you on your buying or selling journey. I also make content designed to help you make your move in and around Vancouver. So if that sounds interesting to you and you wanted to chat with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can book me in the calendar link below that's in the description but regardless if you enjoy weekly real estate content subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a future video all right so let's talk about some of the sales numbers that came out we'll start with the real estate board of greater Vancouver side so excluding Fraser Valley uh, we saw sales pick up considerably compared to this time last year up 20 percent almost 21 percent uh, from June of 2022 inventory itself also decreased, which was kind of interesting for me. I was expecting inventory to continue to pick up both on Metro Vancouver side and on the Fraser Valley side. The metric that we like to look at these days because of how irregular the COVID area era was when it came to real estate, is we like to look at that 10 year average. Now the 10 year average, when it comes to total inventory on the Metro Vancouver side, we're still off by about 17 or 18%. But if we look at new listings that hit in June, we were down only 3%. So new listings is actually creeping up towards that 10 year average mark, which would obviously be the indication of more of an average type of an environment. Now, the total amount of sales from the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, just under 3,000. The total amount of inventory, just under 10,000. So one of the numbers that we look at is something that's called an absorption rate or how many months of inventory is on the market. So if you have about 3,000 sales, you have about 10,000 listings, you know, doing the simple math on that, just over three months of inventory, to give you an idea, a balanced market, if you will, so balance between sellers and buyers, would be at about five to six months worth of inventory. So inventory continues to be the story, definitely uh, on both the Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley side, which, which I'll touch on, but the tightness and the limited amount of inventory has actually maintained real estate prices on the Metro Vancouver side as well. Every segment, apartment, townhome, detached, they all increase month over month in terms of sale price on the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver side. So it's really interesting because last year, 2022, March was the peak. February, March essentially was the peak. And when we look at prices, where we're at today compared to last year, and you take all the product types, you put them all together, we're down about two or 3%. And if you can recall last year, you know, between say July and December, there was a lot of sky is falling sentiment as the Bank of Canada kept raising interest rates and prices started to decline. Uh, there was a lot of talk of market potentially crashing, specifically with certain groups out there. We'll call them uh, bearish groups that are that are thinking the market's going to trend downwards. And again, as we stand here today, every month on the Metro Vancouver side has increased in price. Um, every product type has increased in price. Now, I personally believe as we head into very likely another Bank of Canada interest rate uh, increase. I, I personally believe that the market and pricing will plateau to jump over to the Fraser Valley side of the equation. Sales up year over year, 50% for the month of June. Uh, inventory also decreased uh, year over year on the Fraser Valley side. And, and Fraser Valley, we had seen a really strong uptick in, in new inventory hitting the market, uh, especially in spring. So that was more indic indicative of, of the spring market, I guess you could say. Um, but the interesting thing that's different on the Fraser Valley side uh, is each product type. So again, apartment, uh, townhome, detached home came down in price month over month. And I believe detached home came down around 7% month over month. So that's where the, the two sides differ. Fraser Valley has come down in price, but the sales activity picked up considerably. So that just goes to show you that there's a price for everything. And, and once product reaches a certain price, there will be a lot of buyers that want to buy that product. Uh, I am noticing in terms of, especially on the detached home side, you're not seeing as many multiple offer scenarios 
or you're seeing people go for multiple offers and maybe not getting the multiple offers they were expecting and then adjusting their price. So I think we're gonna see uh, if you're not priced well, especially on that Fraser Valley side uh, with that detached home segment, you're gonna sit on the market and you're gonna have to readjust your expectations, readjust your, your pricing, what you want for a price. You're not gonna get the same price that you would have two or three months ago, but it looks like sellers are getting a little bit more reasonable and wanting to move forward on the sales of their properties. So a lot of talk about obviously inventory in the market and months of inventory, absorption rate, etc. We have to talk about obviously the housing supply side from a construction perspective. So read a report the other day, I believe it was from RBC Economics, and they released a report saying that during the pandemic, construction costs alone for builders went up uh, over 51% during the course of the pandemic. Now, keep in mind that this is taking land price completely out of the equation, which we know if you follow my channel, you know land prices and real estate prices have increased significantly, even having given back some gains over the last you know year or so. Again, we're not much lower than we were a year ago in terms of sale price. So that land price has increased significantly. You have 51% increase in construction costs. Much of that is in the way of uh, steel, concrete. Initially, when the pandemic hit, uh, lumber was kind of the product that had soared in price and developers were struggling uh, with, with the payment, obviously, of, of the surging lumber prices. That has now come back in line, but you know the new lumber, I guess you could say, is concrete and steel which are up over 50%. Uh, and then when you factor in as well, uh, when it comes to home construction costs, the transport gas has gone up, so transportation costs increase as well. Um, so very difficult on builders in terms of, you know, reaching profit margins, being able to meet profit margins. And again, on my channel, we've talked about developers kind of holding off with interest rates increasing as they have uh, up four and a half percent since March of last year. So the cost of borrowing right up. And, and this has put a, a this has constricted a new housing supply on the developer side. Someone actually left a comment on my YouTube channel in regards to immigration. And the reason I want to bring this up now is the other cost that has gone up considerably uh, are labor costs as well and, and not being able to find uh, the right amount of labor, not being able to find enough labor essentially for some of these uh, trades workers that are required on construction sites. Someone left a comment on my YouTube saying, you know, if, if immigrants were to come to Canada, it would be nice if, if they were made to settle in some of the smaller cities to take some of the burden off of Toronto, Vancouver, uh, have them set up in smaller cities where they can essentially help grow that economy for a certain period of time and then be able to move to wherever they like in Canada. It's a great comment and a great idea, but the struggle with it is that the, the workforce, the labor that's required when we have immigrants coming into Canada, we need them in the major cities. We need them in the major cities to fill the jobs that we are essentially inviting them in to fill. So it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. It's, you're, we're bringing people in because we need them. Uh, people are coming and that's putting more of a strain on housing, on housing supply. Yet a lot of these workers are helping in the housing supply equation. So, you know, when you look at Vancouver real estate and you look at all the different pieces, the housing supply, the immigration, you know, you, you hear the saying like a well-oiled machine. I can't say that Vancouver real estate is that. In fact, Vancouver real estate at this point with the way interest rates are today, it's like a machine that's just getting soaked with WD-40 to try and chug this thing along. Um, and, you know, at what point do we start seeing the gaps in this machinery that we're calling Vancouver real estate? I think we're starting to see some of that now. Definitely the federal government is starting to see some of this as well in terms of the strain on homeowners. I've done a lot of videos in terms of the rental market. So if you're interested in where the rental market is today, uh, you can look at some of my previous videos. But the last report I read said 55% of renters are struggling to meet their payments. 45% of mortgage owners now feeling the pinch and struggling to make payments. Uh, that was a Angus Reid poll that was conducted. So now what the federal government has done, and this is part of their spring budget that they came out with, is they've essentially 
essentially uh, released a code of conduct, if you will, for the big banks to use when they're dealing with mortgage holders, those that are uh, in more of dire circumstances when it comes to renewing their mortgages, uh, when it comes to uh, if they're variable rate holders and they're struggling to make payments. So it's not going to be used blanketed across the board. But things like waiving prepayment penalties on mortgages, not charging interest on interest, uh, if extending amortizations for people. So again, when you extend an amortization, that keeps the payment constant. So if banks are to do that, uh, they're to do it for the shortest amount of term possible. But they are putting it out there that this is an option that they want banks to use to make it easier on the homeowner. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because a lot of people are waiting for this pain for when people are renewing mortgages. What exactly are banks going to do at that point to help the homeowner out? What are they going to consider to be a dire circumstance? How are they going to gauge the different levels? Because that is what's going to impact the market the most, I would say, outside of the supply equation. So again, we'll see how that all plays out. But, you know, keep in mind the federal government, no matter who's in place in the federal government, they they want to appease the homeowner. I've said it before on my channel. They are here to protect those that own real estate because the people that own real estate are the voters, right? Six. Uh, last time I checked, the home ownership rate was about 65 to 70 percent in Canada. Uh, the vast majority, they make up the vast majority of voters in Canada. So the federal government will always do what they can to protect the majority, which is the homeowner. Uh, and they're starting that process with this code of conduct. Now, real quickly, before I end off this video, I just want to circle back to the construction costs going up over 50%. The one element that I didn't talk about was development cost charges. Now, development cost charges, they've gone up by as much as 30%, depending on the product type. Uh, and right across Canada. Now, the thing is with Vancouver here is the development cost charges have gone up more for multifamily high density development than they have for single family. So it's almost as if the wrong product type is being incentivized with the single family and the product type that we need more of uh, has gone up more in, in cost for the development costs. Now, the reason I bring this up is there are ways to have those costs waived or at least a portion of, and, and that's done if you are doing a rental project of certain density. TransLink is putting forth a proposal to do a project at Arbutus, uh, right at Arbutus and Broadway, across the street from where the Arbutus station will be for the Broadway subway project. Um, so that's gonna be, I believe it's a 30-story tower. If you hadn't heard, I talked about it before on my channel, TransLink is now getting into the real estate development business along the subway lines and the SkyTrain locations. So I believe this will be their first. And if you want to talk about one of the best places to live in Vancouver, if you are a tenant and you're looking for a place to rent in the future, I don't think you can beat Arbutus and Broadway. You're about a 15 minute walk to Kitts Beach. For me, Kitsilano has always been my favorite neighborhood in the city, but because of my business taking me in other areas around the lower mainland, it didn't make sense for me to move there. But with you know rapid transit coming to the area, um, you're going to start seeing now with the Broadway, uh, with the Broadway plan, you're going to start seeing these high rise development proposals all along that Broadway corridor, right up to Vine. But this TransLink development, I'm going to watch it closely to see how it progresses at Arbutus and Broadway. So there you have it, guys. I hope you learned something in this video. If you did, I'd love it if you could hit the like button because what that does is it takes this video and it sends it out to more people so they can learn from it as well. And again, if you like weekly real estate content, don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss next week's video. And lastly, if you're in the Vancouver area and you want to talk about your real estate situation with me one on one, you can book me in the Calendly link below or just send me a text, give me a call, shoot me an email, whatever is easiest for you. I'd be happy to chat with you. But once again, thank you so much for taking time to watch this week's episode and I look forward to seeing you all next week.